Kundalini. An Occult Experience by George Sidney Arredale. Chapter 9 The Individuality of Kundalini. Curiously enough, even though there seems to be obstruction at the top of the head, not in the center of the head but actually at the top, nevertheless to a certain extent Kundalini pierces its way through and ascends through the top of the head beyond the physical body like a fountain of colored water. The result is a stream which opens out so that there is the appearance of a tunnel, Kundalini flowing outwards, as it were, over the edge of the funnel. In the beginning this funnel emerges only a short distance, but as the piercing process proceeds the force of the stream becomes greater and Kundalini rises to a great height. All head obstructions vanish, with the result that contact is made, a channel pierced, between the various types of consciousness, leading to continuous consciousness and to constant contact between the various planes and the physical brain waking consciousness. What is the nature of the obstruction at the top of the head? It has the appearance of a mass of grains of sand, yellowish in color, through which Kundalini is endeavoring to effect a permanent passage, tearing apart the mass, making a hole through it, a process of some difficulty, some pain, and a certain amount of danger. At first, Kundalini only glows. As time passes, the glow must become a burning nucleus and later a consuming, purifying and releasing fire. These grains of sand presumably are cells, and they are not so close to one another that Kundalini cannot effect some sort of a passage, just as water can escape through a sieve. It is interesting to watch the nature of the process of awakening Kundalini as it takes place during the sleep of the physical body. The most interesting observation is as to the density or solidity of Kundalini itself. From one standpoint, Kundalini is a fire, liquid fire but from another there is an exact simile in the planting of a long pole in a hole in the ground. The earth has to be hollowed out and the pole inserted into the hole thus made. Similarly, in the lower body's obstruction has to be removed from the coarse kundalini must take obstruction both physical, etheric, and possibly higher as well and the picture the student had in his mind's eye as he awoke is of digging away varying densities of solids so that another kind of solid may enter the passage thus cleared. One might well employ the simile of boring into the earth. In the course of the process earth is encountered, earth and water are encountered then perhaps water alone, and if one went far enough down one would meet molten masses and gases of various kinds. Now boring upwards has to take place for Kundalini, and the same kinds of obstructions are encountered, different kinds of solids even though we call them solids, liquids, gases and so on. All are solids. Kundalini is a solid, and if it is to do its work, certain other kinds of solids must be removed out of the way. Not that it cannot more or less interpenetrate them. It can and does permeate them to a certain extent. 
but its main objective cannot be accomplished unless it has a clear passage, and this involves the removal, perhaps only to a very small extent, of physical obstruction, possibly a heaping to either side, just as a crowd has to give way before an oncoming procession. There is probably partly a burning away and partly this crowding on either side. As the channel is formed the pole of Kundalini is pushed up a matter of time. The idea of Kundalini as a pole being gradually inserted into a hole seems to be more accurate than at first sight may appear. The distinctions we make between solids, liquids and gases, and so on, are relative terms. There are solids to which the most solid things we know are supremely light and airy. Some of these solids one notices in the inner regions of the earth. This is one way of regarding solids. Another way is to look upon the increasingly real as, in the truest sense of the word, solid, increasingly solid, substantial. From this point of view, Kundalini is more solid than the most solid substance we know, using the word solid as synonymous for real. Dealing with Kundalini in these terms one is conscious of its solidity as compared with that of physical matter or of substances next in degree of solidity, from the physical plane standpoint, to physical matter. Kundalini seems much more solid than these and the process of awakening Kundalini may thus be not at all inaptly compared with the removal of earth, and of earth mixed with water, for the entry of a pole of solid wood, as has already been suggested. The pole of solid wood is relatively far more solid than earth or water. So is Kundalini from a certain point of view far more solid than the obstructions which have to be removed. I am not surprised, therefore, that the translation into terms of waking consciousness of the digging process, taking place during the sleep of the physical body, is that of the removal of earth and water so that a hole may be made for the entry of a very solid object indeed. In one sense, mental matter is much more solid than emotional matter, buddhic more solid than mental, evaic than buddhic, just as space may be considered more solid than that which fills it. What we call matter can only be where the more solid so-called space is not there to prevent its presence. We have to drive away space in order to make room for matter. But sometimes we must drive away matter in order to make room for space, and this is what we are doing when arousing Kundalini, for Kundalini belongs relatively, more to space than to matter. There are speculations about Kundalini in which one is almost afraid to indulge. Universal, cosmic fire as it is, nevertheless it seems to be constituted of innumerable diverse elements and one or another of these shines forth according to the setting of the fire in individualities belonging to one or another of the great evolutionary streams. Each center represents a line of energy, and in each individuality, therefore, one center is dominant, while another comes next in importance. So is it that Kundalini adapts itself I ought, of course, to say herself to the preeminent note, 
and seems as if it urges the various centers according to their respective importances in the particular human body. It courses lightly, as it were, through the subdominant centers, touching them to minor vivificatio only, but giving radiance indeed to the centers which have special preeminence. And this principle obtains throughout the evolutionary process, in the vast macrocosms no less than in the minutest microcosms. But Kundalini definitely stimulates each center, whirling as each already is, throbbing and piercing its way upwards to the great head junction. There seems to be little doubt that there is a spiral, corkscrew movement of Kundalini as it surges upwards, concentrating on the centers which are outstanding because of the individual's ray, one, and temperament, and sometimes vivifying certain centers which need special stimulation in view of certain work the individual has to undertake. Here one center is stimulated more than the rest. There another center is singled out. And perceiving this one wonders if nations and races, faiths and sects, have their superordinate center as well as their subordinate centers, so that the fire of Kundalini has to be all things to all centers. One wonders if the same be true of land, of sea, of valley, of mountain, of forest, of plain. And then comes the speculation as to the supreme center of the earth. The earth, as we are told, has its color, its note. Has it not its special center also? This seems to be without doubt, as must also be the case with the sun, with the solar system, in fact with every organism. And when one tries to follow this speculation with the inner vision one becomes lost in regions of consciousness which forbid exploration, and one turns back wisely, the regretfully, into those realms which are, as these others are not yet, for our conquering. The burning sensation so usually associated with Kundalini, and by no means confined within the channels of its passage through the body, is not necessarily inevitable. There may be a sensation of cold, of pressure, of a bursting, the latter generally within the head. Some students have experienced an uncomfortable warmth throughout the trunk of the body, with extension into the head, so that the whole of the upper part of the body seems intensely hot, streaming forth heat in all directions. But always, and this is an acid test of the rightness of the experience, the whole body becomes comparatively universalized as to its sensitivity. The whole body becomes, as it were, a gauge of the real, so that discrimination, as has been said before, is alive from the feet to the very top of the head itself. This is a reflection on the physical plane of the absence in the inner bodies of the localizatio of faculties which is so apparent in the physical body itself. There arises, with the vivificatio of Kundalini, a blending of the lower with the higher bodies, so that there begins to be one vehicle receptive and active in every part of its being. In the higher regions of consciousness we cease to speak of vehicles, for the place of these is taken by radiances, 
and when Kundalini is still further developed, the consciousness which in the physical body has localizatios, and in the higher bodies is coextensive with their frontiers, will, in the highest regions, become concentrated in a center, whence rays will issue forth in all directions. Evolution consists in a going forth into the whole of manifested life, in contacting the farthest circumferences, but the way of return is to bring back, stage by stage, to the center the fruits of the going forth, the sum total of all the experiences. Thus do we seem to come to the point of concluding that in some mysterious way Kundalini remains forever individual to its recipient, however much it may always be inseparable from the universal fire whence it issues forth. In some mysterious way it would seem as if Kundalini partakes of the nature of the permanent atom, too cannot disintegrate, and forms the eternal fire of the evolving individuality. I have said that it cannot disintegrate. From one point of view nothing disintegrates. All that anything can do is to return home a while, and this is what Kundalini probably does. The coursing of Kundalini through the centers of the body, it's picking out a special center or centers for major vivificatio, it's issuing forth from the head, it's uificatory powers all are the gathering of experience for the fire which is the individual himself. We must, it seems clear free ourselves from the habit of looking upon our bodies as just flesh and blood, as just matter, as matter is known in these days of feeble vision. All things are modes of manifestation of each other. All are modes of the manifestation of fire, or of any other supreme expression of the creative spirit which we may be able to conceive. In Christian scriptures we have the conception of fire as the third aspect of the Trinity, God the Holy Ghost. But behind all divisions there is the one without a second. And true indeed is it that all that we can predicate of the expressions of the one we can predicate still more of the one itself. So, from one aspect we may express the creative spirit as fire, and all that comes from it as fire no less. Hence we think of Kundalini as the heart, the permanent fire of the vehicles of an individual, and we think we see in the permanent atom the fire of Kundalini awaiting its next forth going. There seem to be in breathings and outbreathings, pulsations of Kundalini. Observation seems to show that all things breathe and that there are the most marvelous interpretations to be assigned to these breathings. The intensity of Kundalini waxes and wanes. It rises and falls, even in its surgings. It is exceedingly difficult to follow all this, for the student who has been observing is inexperienced and in addition is confronted with the intensifications produced in his own Kundalini by the very observations themselves. Attention feeds, as in attention starves, and these constant experiences and experiments increase his own Kundalini activity. In these waxings and wanings Kundalini is evidently profoundly affected by the surroundings of the body in which it dwells.
in the great open spaces, in the harmonious, rhythmic and well-ordered home, at sea, in close proximity to hills and mountains, in special gatherings of an uplifting nature, in well-directed ceremonial gatherings, in churches, temples and mosques round which fine devotion has gathered, in schools and colleges from which all fear is entirely absent and there subsists a beautiful relationship between teachers and taught, in all these, and other conditions of the same type, as in places of study. Kundalini Waxes But in towns and cities, in crowded places, in theatres, restaurants, picture houses, in the ordinary public meeting devoid of any particular aspirational element, Kundalini wanes, that is to say it receives no stimulus. But always is there a tide in the affairs of Kundalini, an ebbing and a flowing, a rising and a falling, however imperceptible. It would seem doubtful if ever Kundalini is actually asleep, however inactive it may appear to be, for it must needs share the functioning of Kudalim everywhere, and as a whole Kundalini is astir throughout the spaces. Nevertheless, we feed Kundalini, and we starve Kundalini, in the veriest trifles of our living physical emotional, mental and beyond. One observation which was of tremendous interest to the student making all these contacts was the use of what is called the thyrsus in the special awakenings of Kundalini which from time to time take place. The thyrsus has the magnetic property of reaching out into intimate touch with Kundalini and of causing Kundalini to follow it as iron is attracted by a magnet. In the ancient days the thyrsus was very well known, and was evidently used in cases where a kind of artificial stimulation of Kundalini was indicated. It was certainly known to the yogis of old in India, and to the Egyptians and the Greeks. The thyrsus observed was manufactured of some brilliantly white metal, cylindrical in shape, about 24 inches long, an inch or so in diameter, and resembled nothing so much as the ordinary ruler. It was placed at the root of the spine and then drawn upwards, Kundalini following after it. Of course, the thyrsus could only be used by those who already had an intimate knowledge of the workings of Kundalini. 1. Theosophy teaches that all life, whether in mineral, plant, animal or man, is the one life. This one life, long before it begins its work in mineral matter, differentiates itself into seven great streams, each of which has its own special and unchanging characteristics. These fundamental types are known as the rays. These seven types are to be found among men and we all belong to one or other of them. Fundamental differences of this sort in the human race have always been recognized. A century ago men were described as of the lymphatic or the sanguine type, the vital or the phlegmatic, and astrologers classify us under the names of the planets as Jupiter men, Mars men, Venus or Saturn men, and so on. 2. The central nucleus of each of man's bodies is a permanent atom, so called because it remains ever within the periphery of the higher aura, 
even when the body itself has disintegrated. At rebirth, from this atom emanates a web-like substance into which the actual atomic particles of the new body are builded. The use of the permanent atoms is to preserve within themselves, as vibratory powers, the results of all the experiences through which they have passed. We must not think of the minute space of an atom as crowded with innumerable vibrating bodies, but of a limited number of bodies each capable of setting up innumerable vibrations. This audio file was created by Payoprita Basic, you can download it at payoprita.com.